Today, we're starting a major backyard renovation. We're turning a water-thirsty grass landscape into a drought-tolerant botanical garden. So stay tuned and step outside. The house behind me is on a great lot and in a great location. What's not so great is the backyard. Sure, it's got some pretty nice features. A swimming pool, a spa, a great ramada, and even an outdoor fireplace. But everything's scattered around the yard. There's absolutely no flow. And there's lots of grass to water. That's all about to change. So Bennett, you guys have lived here how long? About six years now. So what was the backyard like? Well, it was a nice big backyard, but there was no real reason to go out and enjoy it. We had a nice fire pit and a ramada, but nothing really tied everything together. And a lot of lawn back there. Yeah, a great deal of lawn and lots of watering as well. I know you had some problems with pipes and then Constantly the breaking. The system was probably 20 years old, so my weekend hobby was coming home and fixing sprinklers. Well, we're going to do some major renovations back there get some nice connectivity between all the spaces, plus we're going to create some new spaces for you guys to go out and enjoy. Sounds great. So, just what do we have in store for our homeowners? We'll reveal our plan when Step Outside returns. How do you turn a large residential lot full of Bermuda grass into a desert botanical garden? That's our dilemma at this job site. Our plan starts with the pool area. This was an existing pool, but we wanted to create more interest, so we covered the existing cool deck and the brick patios with flagstone throughout. We also added some interest to the pool with these three carved stone fountains that'll spit water back into the pool and give us a nice sound there. Another new area that we added is up here, another little hidden flagstone patio area with a wildlife water feature with water spilling from an upper terrace to a lower pond down in here. The final area of the plan is over here where they had an existing wood deck and fireplace, but we had to add some steps to get up to it because it's much higher than the rest of the yard. And we're going to add a little bit of shade and color with this shade sail cloth structure that's going to go over it. Now the whole area is tied together by this series of granite paths. There's some some uh, riprap swales here that are going to let the water drain off, some flagstone bridges that let us go over the tops of those swales, and it's all tied together with a series of desert trees and a wide assortment of desert plants, shrubs, and ground cover for color and interest. Now we already have these great Thavisha trees out here, but this is a big yard and it's going to need a lot more shade. So we're going to be installing a lot more desert trees, which will keep the yard cooler without running up the water bill. A great place to get ideas for a drought tolerant landscape and to browse through all kinds of desert trees is the Desert Botanical Garden in Phoenix. We dropped in on Matt Goff, an arborist at the garden, to get his take on some of the trees we'll be using. So Matt, this tree here I, I definitely want to use. This is a mesquite. Uh, is this a Chilean mesquite? Uh, well, it's, it's, uh, it, it can be tough. This could be either a Chilean or Prosopis alba. A lot of uh, the trees that are known, of, known as uh, Chilean mesquites in the trade are actually uh, South American mesquites, would probably be a more common name for them. But these trees tend to like cross hybridize, don't they? They, they? they do, they do, yeah. They hybridize very easily, so uh, if you got a uh, seed pot off of this tree, there's no guarantee that it would even uh, look exactly like this tree here. Yeah. Just because the bees pollinate from different they trees? They pollinate freely from tree to tree, and mm -hmm. uh, yep, they, they hybridize See, very Now easily. I noticed that this one is blooming right now, or getting ready to bloom. These are the, the flowers before they're opening and this is what that's going to look like, kind of little catkin type bloom. Right, right. Yep. Now are these messy trees? They are. They're very messy trees, yep. And they, they are deciduous. They will drop their leaves in the winter. Uh, they'll either drop them uh, just before spring or if it gets cold enough they'll drop them in the winter. But this is going to be a big tree. As they we get very see, large. Yeah. This, this thing is probably what, 30 plus feet tall and uh -huh. 40, 50 feet across? Right but a great tree for a canopy and creating kind of a little shade island underneath it for different things to grow. Excellent, you gotta you got, you got be careful about overwatering them. You don't want the uh, root system to uh, not grow as fast as the uh, canopy of the tree. Yeah, now what about pruning them? 
uh, it's, it's a good idea to try and thin them before the monsoon season to allow the air to uh, blow through the canopy of the tree. Otherwise that tree will act like a kite and just we go right over. Blow right over. Yep. But now I've seen trees that have been blown over and they're still growing. Uh, yeah, I think it's kind of neat when they fall over on their side, just let them kind of keep growing right up. Yeah, it's kind of a neat look. Yeah, kind yeah. of that curved, uh, almost hurricane-like trunk look to Exactly, them. exactly. Very neat. Yep. Now another large tree I want to use in our garden is a desert museum Palo Verde, but I didn't see any of those here. Well, we don't have any of those here in the garden, no. Uh -uh. But this is a, kind of similar. This is a Palabrea? This is, yeah. Parkinsonia praecox, yep. has a beautiful branching structure, and again, it's a huge tree. What other Palabres or Palaverdes do you have here? We have uh, both the native Palaverdes, the Foothills and the Blue Palaverde here in the garden. Uh, the Foothills doesn't get quite as big. Uh, an attractive tree though, and uh, the uh, Blue Palaverde, which gets quite a bit larger. Now I like the Blue Palaverde because that bloom is kind of that intense yellow and uh, it's kind of pretty in the garden. It is, it's great, it is. Yeah. Now what about watering for these? Uh, minimal amount of water, they, uh, the native ones especially, they, uh, they are uh, very well adapted to this climate. And pruning, similar to the mesquites? Uh, they don't get quite as big, so you may not have to worry as much about them blowing over. But to get this opening branch and structure, did you guys have to do a lot of pruning on that? Uh, this one did have a lot of pruning done on it, yes. How old would you say this tree is? Uh, I believe it was planted in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. So 30, 40 plus years. Right, right, right. Beautiful tree. So this is one of the trees we're also going to use in the garden. This is a Texas ebony. I like this tree because it tends to be a little smaller than the Palo Verdes and the Mesquites are. Uh -huh. yeah. Now I like it because it's a little bit bigger leaf than a lot of the desert trees have. Uh, very dense shade as we can see down here and this nice bright kind of dark green. It is. It's nice to have this dark green out in the desert. It's... Now will this hold its leaves through the winter? It, it continuously drops leaves. So, so it, it's not necessarily deciduous during the winter. It's deciduous just all year. It constantly drops leaves. Whereas some of the other desert trees though will be more deciduous than this one. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. They would drop their leaves, you know, like a more traditional deciduous tree in the winter. Yeah. Now, is there a lot of litter with this tree? That's... There is quite a bit of litter with this tree, yeah. I mean, I see a lot on the ground down here and then there are these big seed pods that these would only come on once a year, right? Right. And yeah. uh, pretty easy to pick up and clean up. Now, they are. will these seeds actually germinate in the ground? You get a bunch of little baby they can. Trees coming yeah, all sure. over the place. Uh, yeah. They're easy to pick out though, they grow slow, so it's, uh, if you want to get rid of them, just yank them right out. Or if you want to grow some, you just probably got to soak these and maybe notch them and put them in the ground. Huh? It'd probably help. Well, this is a really pretty tree. So. It is, it is. Yeah. So Matt, other than the three trees we looked at today, what other drought tolerant desert trees do you have here in the garden? Well, we have uh, ironwoods, uh, sweet acacias, uh, the cascalode, the Texas mountain laurel. We have. Uh, Lots of trees or shrubs that try to be trees. The desert willow, another one? The desert willow is another one, yeah. Kind of yeah. a messy tree, though. It is, it, it is, yep. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's definitely more of a traditional deciduous tree. Now, the ironwood's another real slow growing one, though, isn't it? It is, it is. It's a beautiful tree, though. I mean, I see them in the nurseries, and usually when they're in a box, even a 36 inch box, I'm getting about a five foot tall tree, where some of the other trees are really trees when I get them in that right. size. You gotta be patient to grow an ironwood, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Matt, thanks for all the great information on trees out here today. Yeah, it was great having you out here today. Thank you. Thanks. Up next, flagstone, quarried right here in Arizona, gets installed on our patio and pool deck. Stay tuned. Thinking about doing your own outdoor remodel? Need a little information or inspiration to get your project started? Then visit us online at cox7.com to find links to our sponsors and full-length episodes of Step Outside. While you're there, check out all the other great programming available on Cox 7 Arizona. Our crew has been pretty busy doing demolition work in the backyard of our remodel. There weren't any structures to take out, but we did have a lot of dirt and rocks to move around. The yard is all prepped and we have these great mounds throughout. To get here, we had to kill off all of the existing grass using several applications of Roundup in between periods of watering to encourage any new growth to show up. Then we brought out our equipment, scraped up the dead grass, and piled it into our mound areas. Next, we scooped up all the river rock and put it on top of that. We did this in a green effort to eliminate adding to the landfill, and we had no carbon footprint from big trucks hauling it away. Because this is at the bottom of our mounds, we really won't be digging into this material with our plantings. Finally, we brought in about 80 yards of soil to do our final shaping of the mounds, which sets the framework of our new botanical garden. Anytime you have a project that has tight access, like we have here, we only have that little side yard 
to get through to the huge backyard, it makes it difficult getting materials into the backyard. Now, we're going to be putting flagstone over most of the existing concrete, but we still have to bring in over eight yards of concrete into this backyard. And I didn't want to kill my guys by asking them to wheelbarrow it in. That would be over 50 wheelbarrows worth of concrete. So we hired a grout pump. You back the concrete truck up to the grout pump hopper, you dump the concrete in there, and then he's got a big machine that just pumps it through the hoses to any place we want it into the backyard. Flagstone is a really great product to incorporate into any new or remodeled landscape. It's versatile, durable, and beautiful. We just finished a backyard makeover where we used it around a new pool in Ramada that we built to provide some outdoor entertainment areas for the owners. One big challenge was that they already had some older existing flagstone on their back patio, which was multicolored, utilizing four different stones. We had to match it, which was quite a feat. Today, we're laying flagstone around the pool and patio areas of our remodel. We're putting in about 2,000 square feet, which we got locally at Anazazi Stone. Grady Daw from Anazazi Stone has come by to see how our job's going. How you doing, Grady? Morning, Pete. How are you? Good to see you again. Yep. Now, when I was at your yard, we picked out two different color stones that we're using here. I think one was classic oak, the other was... Buff, I Buff. believe, okay. yes. And we're mixing those together. I think I'm using a blend that's about 70% uh, buff and 30% uh, classic oak. I like that look just because it kind of gives a little bit more of the color of the stone out as opposed to using all one color. What do you think? Exactly. On this job here, I think with the desert landscape and, and the colors of the houses here, it was going to work out the best. Now, what other types of stone do you have at your yard? Well, on, the, on this job here, we're using Coconino sandstone. That's a local Arizona quarried stone. And there's probably eight different colors. We do bring in sandstones from all over the, the world, even. Africa, we've got stone from India, China. A lot of local stones, uh, Oklahoma with their browns. Now, it's endless. Would you say you have all this stuff in your yard there? In stock. Yes. How big is your facility there? We probably keep upwards of uh, two, three hundred tons of uh, flagstones in stock. Two to three hundred tons? Yes. Because we're only using, what, uh, about twenty tons? Twenty here? tons on this job, yes. Now, other than flagstone, what do you guys carry? We're full service supply yard. We carry all your setting materials, building stones for walls, slates, sandstone, limestones, thin veneer, which is popular for negative edges on pools, barbecues. We have a fabricating facility for cutting all your special edges, uh, wall caps. Because here we're using what's called random size random. stone, right. but you can actually provide square cut stones in almost any sizes, right? Any size, up to uh, whatever uh, the customer would like to have. So if somebody's looking for maybe a little bit more formal approach and they wanted two foot by two foot squares, you could do that and it would almost look like tile, but it's still a flagstone material. Gives a much cleaner look, uh, more modern to the, to the flagstone look. Now, one of the things we always do with a flagstone job is we cut and fit every single piece dry before we even start mixing mud to lay these things down. Exactly. That way we can make sure your joints are correct and, and all the patterns are working out. Now, when we've got finished cutting all our stone, the next thing we're going to do is start mixing our mud to lay the stone, and that's just a mixture of the, uh, the cement and the sand. That's a pretty easy mix to do, but we have to have a pretty strong base to put that on. We're using a one inch minus type flagstone here, and it, it needs to be put on top of a concrete base. Mm -hmm. Now they had an existing cool deck here, which we're covering, and they had an existing patio that had brick on it that we took, took off, and we're gonna cover that with flagstone to match it all the way up from the pool to the house. So again, with that thin stone and with our mortar bed, we'll have a pretty solid product when we're done. Now, if people want to come to your store to purchase product, do you guys uh, have a system for helping them pick stuff? We have uh, a full outside showroom, kind of a garden walk area. Most of all the flagstones are on display. We have many ideas, different types of joint work, uh, different color matches and blends. And it really helps a bunch for our customers. Well, I really appreciate you coming out today, Grady, and uh, giving us some pointers. Thank you, Pete. Good seeing you, and your job looks wonderful. Thanks.
Stay tuned for some tips on adding color to your landscape from one of the valley's oldest and most colorful resorts. The Camelback Inn has been a favorite among valley tourists for decades. Nestled in the foothills of Camelback Mountain, the property is bursting with color throughout the year, thanks in part to staff horticulturist Vanessa Colhorn Brown. So Vanessa, how large is the property here at the Camelback Inn? The property at Camelback Inn is 125 acres. How much of that did you plant and how much is left in the natural state? The natural state is about 28 acres and the rest is all planted. Now, I see a tremendous amount of color with all the annuals here. It looks like a lot of work. Oh, it is. It's uh, quite a bit of work. We have a gardener that takes care of most of this area and does just the flowers. So. so, what different types of annuals do you plant here? Well, we start our fall plantings in October and we use geraniums, delphiniums, foxgloves. We have pansies, petunias calla lilies. I use about 8,000 bulbs, ranunculus, tulips, daffodils. I have three different cycles on my daffodils. When do you have to change over then from the fall? We will start changing out on the 20th of April okay. and it takes a total of about five weeks to get it all in. Now will that last through the summer? It will last all the way to October again. So, so only two times? Two, two Because we're going to be doing some annual beds in this new garden that we're doing primarily around the pool again to get that splash of color. Do you have to do a lot of fertilizing? What's your soil like? My soil is primarily a mixture of um, peat moss and native soil and sand and that's what I've been using for 15 years and it seems to keep an aeration so the roots get enough air to them. That's very important for plant uptake and I use a pre-plant uh, slow release fertilizer also, you can force the plant to bloom mm. if you choose, but honestly, I don't have to do that. So. Well, I notice you have a lot of water features here. We're going to be doing a water feature, and I want to do some plantings there. I think we ought to go take a look at uh, what you've got going on there. Sounds good. So it, in our project, we're going to have a little water feature. I kind of call it a wildlife water because I want to attract the birds. And it'll have a little upper pool that spills in the lower pool. It won't be quite this long. But what plants have you planted around here that do really well around the water? Well, we planted the hearts and flowers there to spill over more of a cascading type mm -hmm. plant. And also, I kind of wanted to bring the desert into this area because, it, as you can see, it's kind of a green area. And I want to kind of balance out from the other part of the resort, which is mostly desert state, and move it down into this area. And slowly, I been able to bring some of the desert plants with the ocotillos, the cassias, the aromophila, which is behind us. And, um, and that'll attract the hummingbirds. Yes, and, and a lot of the different flowering cactus, like the cactus here, which is an Argentine giant that gets the really large flowers on do it. Do the bats pollinate that at night? Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'll bet yeah. they love the water as much as the birds do, huh? Yes, they do. The, the sound here is just phenomenal. And that's kind of what we're going to hope to achieve in our garden, to kind of create a peaceful little retreat yeah. with the water. That's, that, that was what our thought was. We wanted to create a kind of like an oasis for people to come. Mm -hmm. We're doing something very similar to what you've done here on our project. We're going to take out some lawn and create these mounds to get some interest, add some boulders. And we want to deal with the water runoff, so we're going to do some riprap swales kind of like you've got here, and then create a lot of plants. I also have some granite paths to almost encourage them to get out in the garden and good spots for like garden sculpture or other things of interest like that. We have an artist here on the property who we feature, his name's Dave McGarry, and he has all the bronzes on the property. And Chief Washakie has actually been in the State Department and he's beautiful. If you know anything about Dave McGarry, his bronzes are so lifelike and the Indians that he portrays are even to down to the beadwork is just amazing. That's definitely creates some interest along with the plants and things. Now yeah. you have some more lawn areas you're going to do the same thing too? Yes, right next to us here we have a lawn area that we're going to be moving towards this type of look because we're trying to reduce the amount of water we use and this is a perfect area for that. I'd like to spread the desert scape on up to get rid of the grass and help promote more desert scape. Well, Vanessa, I really appreciate you showing us your property here today. It's been nice meeting with you.
Thinking about doing your own outdoor remodel? Need a little information or inspiration to get your project started? Then visit us online at cox7.com to find links to our sponsors and full-length episodes of Step Outside. While you're there, check out all the other great programming available on Cox 7 Arizona. Well, we've given you a little taste today of what our Backyard Remodel Project is all about. But you're going to have to be sure to tune into the next two shows because we'll cover every aspect of what it takes to turn your backyard into your very own Desert Botanical Garden. Next up on our to-do list is placing boulders around the yard, pouring our concrete steps, and installing some of our lighting. We have a ways to go, but I think our homeowners will really enjoy the finished design. Each week on Step Outside, we show you some of the endless possibilities that await you just beyond your door. So come on, step outside and enjoy the view. I'm Pete Cure. See you next time. Some people look at a yard and think, what can I do? Pete Cure looks at a yard and thinks, what can't I do? Travel around the state with Arizona landscape architect Pete Cure as he turns boring to beautiful and simple to spectacular. Step outside and enjoy the view Wednesday nights at 7 only on Cox 7 Arizona. Sponsored by Horizon Distributors, Pioneer Landscaping Materials, and Anasazi Stone.